These so-called zero cables gaming PC builds are getting more and more popular. And with a wider range of GPUs, motherboards, and even third-party cases supporting this back to front technology, your list of options are only growing. Now in this video, I'm going to be building a super powerful build with as few visible cables as possible to see whether it really is time to go cable free or not. Let's do this. Take your audio up a level with the NZXT Relay High Fidelity Audio Ecosystem. Whether it's the impressive 80 watt relay speakers for great desktop audio, or the relay subwoofer that adds that much welcome bass kick, Relay lets you elevate your audio game. What's more, their switch mix with built-in DAC allows easy control over your audio, and you can switch audio outputs easily by just picking up the Relay headset. One that features DTX Headphone X for 3D spatial sound. Check out our review of the Relay in the cards now or buy one for yourself at the first link below. I'm gonna kick this video off by walking through all the parts I selected for this build, how easy or not easy they are to put together, and then look at performance later. Everything from frame rate data in hard to run AAA titles to easier FPS games, and of course that key temperature info on the GPU and CPU too. Now, this build is incredibly powerful, and in what is a fairly compact ATX case, this could get a bit interesting. Now, let me start with the CPU and GPU combo. Now, I'll be honest, I've got a bit all out. This is an RTX 4090. It doesn't get any better than this. Now, this particular model is the Asus ROG Strix BTF edition. Now, BTF is Asus's name for the zero cables design. MSI call it Project Zero, and Gigabyte, I'm sure, will have their own modern solution on the way too. Now, the difference between this and MSI is that on the Asus cards, you actually find an extra little power connector just down here. That interfaces with compatible motherboards. You're going to have to buy an Asus one. It's not a unified standard to deliver power to the graphics card with no Gen 5 power cables needed, visible to the GPU. Now I'm going to pair this up with either Intel's Core i9-14900K or their i7-14700K. Now the reason I give two options is I'm not sure how well the i9 is going to cope with the cooling in this build and whether it's going to thermal throttle enough that the i7 makes more sense. I would say as well for gaming, the i7 is more than capable for what you need, with the i9 only really useful for extreme like video editing and rendering tasks where the extra cores are helpful. Intel still have a massive core advantage over AMD. Now, while all cores aren't created equal, Intel's E cores, for example, are not as powerful as their P cores or AMD's standard cores. However, for multi-threaded applications, Intel win out in a pretty big way. Now, I'm going to start by installing as many parts as possible onto the motherboard. Just because this is a high-end build doesn't mean we're doing things any differently. This particular motherboard is Asus's Maximus Z790 Hero BTF Edition. No surprises there. Now, to give you a brief overview of just some of the features, you get a 20 plus 1 plus 2 power stage delivery on the VRMs, of course, room for DDR5 memory, PCI Gen 5 NVMe drives, and then on the rear I.O., you've also got a pair of Thunderbolt ports for loads and loads of throughput alongside things like a 2.5 gig Ethernet and Wi-Fi 7 compatibility. So loads of features at play here. Where's the CPU gone? That's a very good question. There it is. A CPU is going to be my first port of call. You can see where the socket is on the motherboard. I'm just going to pop the arm down, lift the socket up, and then drop our i7 or i9 into place. I'll link both options below. As I say, it all depends on your use case for this build. And keep an eye on the temperature information later, which I'm particularly intrigued to test out. Uh, pop the socket cover down. Yeah, there we go. And the black plastic is going to free and get out of the way. Now, memory wise, I've gone for a bit of a thermal take theme in this build. Their Ceres 300, which is one of their BTF cases, reviewed really well with us when we looked at it the first time around. I like the mesh at the front. The tempered glass is cool. It's just a really nice chassis. And I was intrigued to see whether cramming loads of hardware into, again, a fairly compact ATX chassis. This is smaller than the likes of an NZXT H7, Corsair 5000 series case, actually has a bad thermal impact. I think it should be fine, but only time will tell. Now, in keeping with that theme, I've got a whopping 64 gigabytes of their DDR5 Tough RAM. It matches the motherboard so, so well. And in a market where I feel like there aren't that many DDR5 options, like all of Corsair's designs are fairly similar to one another. Same goes for the likes of Team Group and G-Skill 2. It's nice to have something a little bit different. Now, I'm going to use all four RAM DIMM slots, which is arguably less good for, obviously, future upgrades. You could go for 232 gig DIMMs instead and have a bit more upgradability. But I don't see this build ever needing more than 64 gigs. So to be honest with you, it's going to be totally fine. 
And with the final round of mint, we're pretty much good on that front. Now, the next and sort of final stage really on the motherboard assembly is gonna be the storage. I've gone pretty high end again in this build, no surprises, Samsung's 990 Pro. Now, I could have gone for a Gen 5 drive. The reason I didn't is that this is more than fast enough and two terabytes of capacity for around $170, give or take, is gonna be spot on. Latest price and availability can be found at the links in the description. In this board, it's going to install into this top slot just here. It would be nice to see this be a tallest design, but I guess with Z790 getting on a bit now, maybe Asus are holding this back for their next gen I don't know, Intel 15th gen processor designs. The only other thing I'm gonna do at this stage before moving this into the case is look at the CPU cooler mounting hardware. When I mentioned earlier that I was feeling a little bit nervous about the cooling, this is why. Now this is Thermaltake's Tough Liquid 280. I love these fans, like real personal favorite of mine. They're not the reason I'm nervous. It's more to do with the size. Now because of the pure length of the 1490, I can't put a 360 mil in the front, which this case does support, as the GPU's too long. That means I'm limited to a 280 in the top. And of course that i9 is uh, is very hot. So we're gonna have to see how things fare up. Now with that being said, what I can do for now is try and prep the installation for the cooler and make my life a bit easier later. I must admit, I don't always like to use the instruction manual, but the CPU cooler is um, its definitely the time you want to be doing so. Now inside the box, this looks actually kind of simple. You get a bag of Intel mounting hardware. Now that starts off with a back plate. There's two by the looks of things, one for 1150, one for 1700. So that's the one that we'll want. And you also then get a metal bracket, which is gonna go around the actual CPU water block itself, alongside a bag of screws. Very simply, the back plate's gonna go on the rear of the motherboard and all four screws in each corner around the CPU. Nice and simple, the rest can wait until later. While I'm here, I'm also gonna go ahead and replace the AMD mounting bracket on the actual water block with one that's gonna fit the Intel CPU in this build. Then it's time to move it all into the case. And this is where I'm getting slightly nervous about the size. I'm feeling like maybe this case is just about gonna be big enough. I always like to remove all the side panels. You're gonna need to do it in the end anyway. So getting this done nice and early, it just makes everything that little bit easier. Now with this being an ATX board inside of an ATX case, all the standoffs are gonna be A-OK. -okay, so I've got no problems there. Just gotta be careful because the ports on this board on the rear are, well, they're quite sharp actually. You've got to be really, really careful of that when you of course go and slide the motherboard into place. Once lined up, the motherboard should sit of its own accord. That's going to give me time to screw in the three screws at the top, three along the middle and three down the bottom. And while I'm here, I'm also going to go ahead and pop the radiator in with the fans underneath the radiator and the rad installed to the top of the case. I'm then just going to finish things off with the water block. Now that's going to pop really easily on top of the CPU and secure down with these four tension screws around each corner. And with that done, it's finally time for the GPU. Now, as mentioned earlier, RTX 4090 is about as good as it gets. And this Strix model is, oh, it's, it's beautiful. I've had the tough 4090 previously, and that's a nice graphics card, but this takes things up a notch. And I think, let's be honest, once we get into 4090 money, oh, so nice. It's kind of an extra £150 on a cooler, another $200. It sort of gets lost in the noise. Oh, you beauty. Look at that. Three large fans. We've got the really nice red and blue accents. Won't be for everyone, but when you're installing the graphics card in the standard horizontal orientation, you're not really going to see it anyway. Now, you can see just here where the original power connector would have been. It looks to me like they've just added a, a bit of plastic in to sort of cover that off, but I suppose that's okay. Large back plate, massive cooler, IO wise, loads of options. We've got two HDMIs and then three display ports. I mean, it's just a lovely looking card. And this bit right here is where the extra power delivery is going to come from. More on actually connecting the power up to this build in a few moment's time. Now, with a bit of luck, first of all, we need to check that this fits. That is easily done by hovering the GPU over, and yes, it looks like we're good. Now, I'm not going to install it into the slot, but see instead which of the rear PCI lanes need to be removed. In this build, it's going to be the second and third. So these are thumb screws, but you'll find them be quite tight, so unscrew these with a screwdriver instead. Then carefully line the graphics card up, slide it into the slot. Oh, here we go, nearly. Yes, and that's basically it. Use the same screw 
screws you've just removed to secure the graphics card in and stop the wobble, and that's going to deliver all the power and data to the GPU. Nice and simple. I think so far that's looking pretty good. There are a few more changes that I want to make while we're doing all the big stuff. The next of those is to fans. Now at the rear and at the front are a non-RGB and some basic RGB fans. What I'm going to do is take the front panel off, there we are, and unscrew both these fans at the front, replacing them with Thermaltake SWA fans. These are the ones where you can swap the blades around. It's really, really cool. Do that for the front and the rear with three 140s, providing better airflow and better aesthetics. With the fans sorted, we should probably look at the back because in this system, it's the back where all the magic happens. The reason for that is obviously these back connect motherboard designs. So you can see down the bottom here, we've got all those front panel cables, USB 2, USB 3, our SATA's down here, CPU power and fan headers at the top with your motherboard where you'd expect on the right, but the left hand side. And then this is where things get interesting. This here, this is our PCI Gen 5 power connector. And that is what's feeding the power from the power supply into, of course, the graphics card through that proprietary slot. Now for this build, I've gone for a 1200 watt unit from Thermaltake, here it is. More Thermaltake theme, thanks to Thermaltake for sending out the bits at my request for this video. Is this a little bit overkill? I would have said yes, but obviously you've got 1490 and we've got a 14900K or 14700K, depending on what you pick. Both of those CPUs are incredibly power hungry and it's arguably one of the biggest problems Intel has got right now. Well, with their whole lineup really is the power consumption and the heat output. Now this is ATX3 fully modular, meaning you get that PCI Gen 5 cable and you only plug in out of the bag of cables, the ones you actually need. Now for this build, obviously the cable management is gonna be a lot, lot easier. That particularly, especially when combined with how easy all of the power cables should be to plug in, makes systems like this really easy for first time builders. Though I'm not sure how many people were building a 4090 system as their first build. If you are, let me know in the comments down below. For this build, I'm gonna plug in GPU and CPU power connections alongside one SATA power cable. This might seem odd as we've not got any SATA hard drives or SSDs, obviously. However, RGB controllers and stuff tend to utilize the SATA standard. There we are, before finally rounding things off with the motherboard connector, which is of course the largest of the bunch and goes just down the bottom here on the power supply. That is gonna slide in through the rear, a little something like this, and secure down with four included PSU screws. I'll save the cave management for later, but you can see how easy this is. Just literally plug the motherboard in and that's it. And it's the same for things like the CPU. Just take that CPU power connector, run it up to the top right hand side of the motherboard, and plug it in. Now it's so, so simple. I've heard some people say it kind of takes the fun and the complication out of PC building. But when it comes to power and front panel cables, I've got to say, I kind of love it. Now let's look closely at that PCI Gen 5 power cable next of all. Again, we haven't got to run this to the front of the motherboard tray and instead just slot it in like that. I mean, how unbelievably simple. You do have to be careful because we're gonna have to bend this back quite firm to get the rear panel on, but we should be okay. I'm also gonna go ahead and finish up all the front panel cables here and do some cable management as the next stage. And this is the result. It makes it so easy to cleanly cable manage a build. There's not a whole load of cable bulge and the side panels are gonna go on without too many problems. The big question I have though, is will this thing actually boot up in order for us to benchmark it? I guess there's only really one way to find out. One power cable into the back of the machine, power button on. Oh dear, maybe I didn't hit it hard enough. Okay, so we have top fans, we're getting there. And that for the moment seems to be about it. Let me get into the software, get these things tuned up and I'll rejoin you in a second for those performance benchmarks. First though, it's time for a Gigawatt montage. Moving through into performance and it's time to see how this undeniably incredibly expensive and very high-end build performs. Kicking straight off with the tested in Call of Duty's Warzone, here at 4K high with DLSS on the quality preset, this system pulled in a pretty astonishing 205 FPS. And while I'd implore you to watch the rest of the benchmarks, this is a bit of an example of what the 4090 achieves across the board. Take for example Starfield, a game where we often struggle to hit 60 FPS at 1080p. Well, 4 
4K high and this build breaks through the triple digit FPS barrier with 103 FPS on average. It was also here that I saw CPU temperatures spike to their highest point, up to 94 degrees Celsius, even just momentarily. The 280mm cooler here then sufficient for gaming applications, but whether or not I'd recommend this particular config for high-end video editing or rendering, I'm really not too sure. It was a similar story in Hogwarts Legacy, the frame rate slightly lower at 97 FPS, but again testing at 4K high. And in an RPG title like this, where frame rate is arguably a bit less important, 97 is still pretty extraordinary. If frame rate's what you're after, just for a bit of fun, I also tested Fortnite at 1080p competitive settings. That's going to really expose any CPU bottlenecks if there are any. And here the build pulled in 345 FPS. I mean, what on earth? Absolutely unbelievable. Apex Legends also did really, really well. 4K high. Uh, this system achieved 245 FPS on average. Well, my longtime favorite game, F1 2023, can't wait for 2024. Ultra high with DLSS enabled and set to quality achieved over 230 FPS on average. The 1490 has impressively held its place as just an incredible GPU from the day it launched and while it's undeniably ridiculously expensive it's performance figures like these that help to at least somewhat justify why. Links to everything today will be down in the description below if you enjoyed it get subscribed drop me a comment let me know what you think of this build and as always I'll see you in the next one.